Oh yeah. One end of the great barn was piled high with new hay and over the pile hung the four talon Jackson fork suspended from its pulley. The hay came down like a mountain slope to the other end of the barn and there was a level place as yet unfilled with the new crop. At the sides, the feeding racks were visible and between the slats, the heads of horses could be seen. It was Saturday afternoon, the resting horses nibbled the remaining wisps of hay and they stamped their feet and they bit the wood of the mangers and rattled the halter chains. The afternoon sun sliced in through the cracks of the barn walls and lay in bright lines on the hay. There was the buzz of flies in the air, the lazy afternoon humming. From outside came the clang of horseshoes on the playing peg and the shouts of men playing encouraging, jeering, but in the barn it was quiet and humming and lazy and warm. Only Lenny was in the barn and Lenny sat in the hay beside a packing case under a manger in the end of the barn that had not been filled with hay. Lenny sat in the hay and looked at a little dead puppy that lay in front of him. Lenny looked at it for a long time and then he put out his huge hand and stroked it, stroked it clear from one end to the other. And then he said softly to the puppy, why do you got to get killed? You ain't so little as mice. I didn't bounce you hard. He bent the pup's head up and looked in his face and he said to it, now maybe George ain't gonna let me tend no rabbits if he fins out you get killed. He scooped a little hollow and, and, and laid the puppy in it and covered it over with hay out of sight, but he continued to stare at the mound he had made. He said, this ain't no bad thing like I got to hide in the brush. Oh no, this ain't, I'll tell George I found it dead. He unburied the puppy and inspected it and he stroked it from ears to tail. He went on sorrowfully. But he'll know, George always knows. He'll say, you done it. Don't try to put nothing over on me. And he'll say, now just for that, you don't get to tend no rabbits. Suddenly his anger arose. God damn me, he cried. Why do you got to get killed? You ain't so little as mice. He picked up the pup and held it from him. He turned his back on it. He sat bent over his knees and he whispered, now I won't get to tend no rabbits. Now he won't let me. He rocked himself back and forth in his sorrow. From outside came the clang of horseshoes on the iron stake and then a little chorus of cries. Lenny got up and brought the puppy back and laid it on the hay and sat down. He stroked the pup again. You wasn't big enough, he said. They told me and told me you. Told me you wasn't. I didn't know you'd get killed so easy. He worked his fingers on the pup's limp ear. Maybe George won't care, he said. This here goddamn little son of a bitch was nothing to George. Curdy's wife came around the end of the last stall. She came very quietly so that Lenny didn't see her. She wore a bright con dress and the mules with the red ostrich feathers. Her face was made up and the little sausage curls were all in place. She was quite near to him before Lenny looked up and saw her. In a panic, he shoveled hay over the puppy with his fingers. He looked sullenly up at her. She said, what you got there, sonny boy? Lenny glared at her. George says, I ain't have to have nothing to do with you. Talk to you or nothing. She laughed. George giving you orders about everything. Lenny looked down at the hay. He says, I can't tell no rabbits if I talk to you or anything. She said quietly, he's scared Curly will get mad. Well, Curly got his arm in a sling. And if Curly gets tough, he can break his other hand. You don't, you didn't, you didn't put nothing over on me about getting it caught in no machine, but Lenny was not to be drawn. No, sir, I ain't gonna talk to you or nothing. She now in the hay beside him. Listen, she said, all the guys got a horseshoe tenement going on. It's, it's on you about four o'clock. It's only about four o'clock. None of the guys is going to leave that tenement. Why can't I talk to you? I never get to talk to nobody. I get awful lonely. Lenny said, well, I ain't supposed to talk to you or nothing. I get lonely, she said. You can talk to people, but I can't talk to nobody. But Curdy, else he gets mad. How do you like, how do you like not to talk to anybody? Lenny said, well, I ain't supposed to. George scared I'll get in trouble. She changed the subject. What you got covered up there? And all of Lenny's, uh, then all of Lenny's woe came back on him. Just my pup, he said sadly, just my little pup. And he swept the hay from on top of it. Why, he's he's dead, she cried. He was so little, said Lenny. I was just playing with him and he made like he's gonna bite me and I made him like I was gonna smack him and, and I done it and then he was dead. She consoled him. Don't you worry none, he was just he was just a mutt. You can get another one easy. The whole country is full of mud. So it ain't that so much, Lenny explained miserably. George ain't gonna let me tend no rabbits now. Why don't he? Well, he said if I done any more bad things, he ain't gonna let me tend the rabbits. She moved closer to him and she spoke soothingly. Don't you worry about talking to me. Listen to the guys yell out there. They got four dollars bet in that ten tenement. None of them ain't gonna leave till it's over. If George sees me talking to you, he'll give me hell, Lenny said cautiously. He told me so. Her face grew angry. What's the matter with me? She cried. And I ain't got a right to talk to anybody. What do they think I am? Anyways. You're a nice guy. Don't know why I can't talk to you. 
I ain't doing no harm to you. While George says, you'll get us in a mess. Aw, oh, nuts, she said. What kind of harm am I to you? Seems like they ain't none of them cares I got how I how I got to live. I tell you, I ain't used to living like this. I could have made something of myself, she said darkly. Maybe I will yet. And then her words tumbled out in a passion of communication as though she hurried before her listener could be taken away. I lived right in Selena, she said. Come, come there when I was a kid. Well... A show come through and I met one of the actors. He said I could go with that show, but my old lady wouldn't let me. She says because I was only 15, but the guy said I could have. If I'd have went, I'd be living like this. I wouldn't be living like this, you bet. Then he stroked the pup back and forth. Wait, we're going to have a little place and rabbits, he explained. She went on with her story quickly before she was uh, should be interrupted. Another time I met a guy and he was in pictures. Went out to the Riverside Dance Palace with him. He says he was going to put me in the movie. He says I was natural. Soon as he got, soon as he got back to Hollywood, he was gonna write to me about it. She looked closely at Lenny to see whether she was impressing him. I never got that letter, she said. I always thought my old lady stole it. While I wasn't gonna stay no place where I couldn't get nowhere or make something of myself, and where they stole your letters, I asked her if she stole it too, and she says no. So I married Curly, met him out, met him out to the Riverside Dance Palace that same night. She demanded, "You listening? Me? Sure." Well, I ain't told this to nobody before. Maybe I ought to. I don't like Curly. He ain't, he ain't a nice fella. And because she had confided in him, she moved closer to Lenny and sat beside him. Could have been in the movies and had nice clothes, all the nice clothes like they were. And I couldn't sat, could have sat in them big hotels and had pictures took of me. When they had them previews, I could have went to them and spoke in the radio and wouldn't have cost me a cent because I was in the picture and all the nice clothes like they were because this guy says I was a natural. She looked up at Lenny and she made a small grand gesture with her arm and hand to show that she could act. The fingers trailed after her leading wrist and her little, uh, little fingers stuck out grandly from the rest. Lenny sighed deeply from outside came the clang of a horseshoe on meadow and then a chorus of cheers. Somebody made a ringer, said Curly's wife. So Curly's all being woed. Now the light was lifting as the sun went down and the sun streaks climbed up the wall and fell over the feeding racks and over the heads of the horses. Lenny said, maybe if I took this pup out and throw him away, George wouldn't ever know. And then I could tend the rabbits without no trouble. Curly's wife said angrily, don't you think of nothing but rabbits? We're going to have a little place, Lenny explained patiently. We got to have a house and a garden and a place for alfalfa. And that alfalfa is for the rabbits. And I take a sack and get a full, all full of alfalfa. And then I take it to the rabbits. She asked, what makes you so nuts about rabbits? Lenny had to think carefully before he could uh, before he could come to a conclusion. He moved cautiously close to her until he was right against her. I like to pet nice things. Once at a fair, I seen some of them long hair rabbits and they was nice, you bet. Sometimes I even pet a mice, but not when I could get nothing better. Curly's wife moved away from him a little. I think you're nuts, she said. No, I ain't, Lenny explained earnestly. George says, I ain't. I like to pet nice things with my fingers, soft things. She was a little bit reassured. Well, who don't? She said, everybody likes that. I like to feel silk and vel velvet. Do you like to feel velvet? Lenny chuckled with pleasure. You bet, by God, he cried happily. And I had some too. A lady gave me some, and that lady was my own Aunt Clara. She gave it right to me about this big a piece. I wish I had that velvet right now. A frown came over his face. I lost it, he said. I ain't seen it for a long time. Curly's wife laughed at him. You're nuts, she said, but you're a kind of nice fella, just like a big baby, but a person can see kind of what you mean. When I'm doing my hair sometimes, I just sit and stroke it because it's so soft. To show how she did it, she ran her fingers over the top of her head. Some people got kind of coarse hair, she said complacently. Take Curly, his hair is just like wire, but mine is soft and fine. Of course, I brush it a lot. That makes it fine. Here, feel right here. She took Lenny's hand and put it on her head. Feel right around there and see how soft it is. Lenny's big fingers fell to stroking her hair. Don't you mess it up, she said. Lenny said, oh, that's nice. And he stroked harder. Oh, that's nice. Look out now, you'll mess it up. You'll muss it. And then she cried angrily. You stop it now, you'll mess it all up. She jerked her head sideways and Lenny's fingers closed on her hair and hung on. Let go, she cried, you let go. Lenny was in a panic, his face was contorted. She screamed then and Lenny's other hand closed over her mouth and nose. Please don't, he begged. Oh, please don't do that, George will be mad. She struggled violently under his hands, her feet battered on the hay and she writhed to be free. W W-R-I-T-H-E-D. Uh, she writhed to be free, and from under Lenny's hand came a muffled scream. Lenny began to cry with fright. Oh, please don't do none of that, he begged. George is going to say I had done a bad thing. He ain't going to let me tend no rabbits. He moved his hand a little, and her coarse cry came out. And Lenny grew angry. Now don't, he said. I don't want you to yell. You're going to get me in trouble, just like George says he will. Now don't you do that. And she continued to struggle, and her eyes were wild with terror. He shook her then, and he was angry with her. Don't you go yelling, he said. And she shook her, and her body flopped like a fish, and then she was still. For Lenny had broken her neck. He looked down at her, and carefully he removed his hand from her, 
over her mouth and she lay still. I don't want to hurt you, he said, but George would be mad if he yelled. When she didn't answer nor move, he bent closely over her. He lifted her arm and let it drop. For a moment, he seemed bewildered and then he whispered in fright, I done a bad thing, I done another bad thing. He pawed up the hay until it partly covered her. From outside the barn came a cry, a man in the double clang of shoes on metal. For the first time, then he became conscious of the outside. He crouched down in the hay and listened. I done a real bad thing, he said. I shouldn't have did that. George will be mad, and he said, and hide in the brush till he come. He's going to be mad in the brush till he come. That's what he said. Lenny went back and looked at the dead girl. The puppy lay close to her. Lenny picked it up. I'll throw him away, he said. It's bad enough like it is. He put the pup under his coat, and he crept to the barn wall and peered out between the cracks toward the horseshoe game. And then he crept around the end end of the last manger and disappeared. The sun streaks were high on the wall by now and the light was growing soft in the barn. Curdy's wife lay on her back and she was half covered with hay. It was quiet. It was very quiet in the barn and the quiet of the afternoon was on the ranch. Even the clang of the pitched shoes, even the voices of the men in the game seemed to grow more quiet. The air in the barn was dusking, dusking in advance of the outside day. A pigeon flew in, and through the open door. No, a pigeon flew through the, um, through the open hay door and circled and flew out again. Around the last stall came a shepherd bitch leaning long with heavy hanging dugs halfway to the packing box where the puppies were she caught the dead scent of curdy's wife and the hair rose along her spine she whimpered and cringed to the packing box and jumped in among the puppies curdy's wi wife lay with a half covering of yellow hay and the meanness and the plannings and the discontent and the ache for attention were all gone from her face she was very pretty and simple and her face was sweet and young now her rouged cheeks and her red and lips made her seem alive and sleeping very lightly the curls, tiny little sausages were spread on the hay behind her head and her lips were parted. As happened sometimes, the moment settled and hovered and remained for much more than a moment. And sound stopped and movement stopped for, for much, much more than a moment. Then gradually time awakened again and moved sluggishly on. The horses stamped on the other side of the feeding racks and the halter chains clinked. Outside, the men's voices became louder and clearer. From around the end of the last stall, old Candy's voice came. Lenny, he called. Oh, Lenny, you in here? I've been figuring some more. I'll tell you what we can do, Lenny. Old Candy appeared around the end of the last stall. Oh, Lenny, he called again. And then he stopped, and his body stiffened. He rubbed his smooth wrist on his white stubble whiskers. I didn't know you was here, he said to Curly's wife. When she didn't answer, he stepped nearer. You aren't to sleep out here, he said disapprovingly. And then he was beside her and said, oh, Jesus Christ. He looked about helplessly and he rubbed his beard. And then he jumped up and went quickly out of the barn. But the barn was alive now. The horses stamped and snorted and they chewed the straw of their bedding and they clashed the chains of their halters. In a moment, Kenny came back and George was with them. George said, what was it you wanted to see me about? Kenny pointed at Curdy's wife. George stared. What's the matter with her? He asked. He stepped closer and then he echoed Candy's words. Oh, Jesus Christ. He was down on his knees beside her. He put his hand over her heart and finally... When he stood up slowly and stiffly, his face was as hard and as tight as wood, and his eyes were hard. Candy said, what done it? George looked coldly at him. Ain't you got any idea, he asked, and Candy was silent. I should have knew, George said, hopelessly. I guess maybe way back in my head I did. Candy asked, what are we going to do now, George? What are we going to do now? George was a long time in answering. Guess we got to tell the guys. I guess we got to get them and lock them up. We can't let them get away. Why, the poor bastards starve, and he tried to reassure himself. Maybe they'll lock them up and be nice to him. But Candy said excitedly, we gotta let him get away. You don't know that Curly. Curly gonna want to get him lynched. Curly get him killed. George watched Candy's lips. Yeah, he said at last, that's right. Curly will and the other guys will. And he looked back at Curly's wife. Now Candy spoke his greatest fear. You and me can get that little place. Can we, George? You and me can go there and live nice. Can we, George? Can we? Before George answered, Candy dropped his head and looked down at the hay. He knew. George said softly, I think I know from the very, very first. I think I know we'd never do her. He used to like to hear about it so much, I got to thinking maybe we would. Then it's all off, Candy asked sulkily. Sulkily. George an uh, didn't answer the, his question. George said, I'll work my month and I'll take my 50 bucks and I'll stay all night in some lousy cat house or I'll sit in some pool room till everybody goes home. Then I'll come back and work another month and I'll have 50 bucks more. Candy said, he's such a nice fella. I didn't think he'd do nothing like this. George still stared at Curly's wife. I ain't never done it in meanness. He said all the time he'd done bad things, but he never done one of them in, in mean. He straightened up and looked back at Candy. Now listen, we gotta tell the guys. They got to bring him in, I guess. They ain't, they ain't no way out. Maybe they won't hurt him, he said sharply. And I ain't gonna let him hurt Lenny. Now you listen, the guys might think I was in on it. I'm gonna go in the bunkhouse and in a minute you come out and tell the guys about her and I'll come along and make it like I never seen her. Will you do that so the guys won't think I was in on it? Candy said, sure, George, sure, I'll do it. Okay, give me a couple of minutes then and you come running out and, and tell like you just found her. I'm going now. George turned and went quickly out of the barn. Oh, Kenny watched him go. He looked helplessly back at Curdy's wife and gradually he saw and his anger grew into words. You goddamn tramp, he said viciously. You done it, didn't you? I suppose you're glad. Everybody knows you messed things up. You wasn't no good. You ain't no good now, you lousy tart. He sniveled and his voice shook. I could have hoed in the garden and watched dishes for them guys. He paused and then 
went on in a sing song and he repeated the old words. If there was a circus or a baseball game, we would have went to her. Just said to hell with work and went to her. Never asked nobody say so. And they'd have been a pig and chickens and in the winter, the little fat stove and the rain coming and just sitting there. His eyes blinded with tears and he turned and went weakly out of the barn. And he rubbed his bristly whiskers with his wrist stump. Outside the noise of the game stopped. There was a rise of voices in question, a drum of runny feet, and then men burst into the barn. Slim and Carlson and Young Wit and Curdy and Crooks keeping back out of attention range. Candy came after them and last of all came George. George had put on his blue denim coat and buttoned it. And his, ba his black hat was pulled down low over his eyes. The men raced around the last stall. Their eyes found Curdy's wife in gloom. They stopped and stood still and looked. Then Slim went quietly over to her. Um, Slim went quietly over to her and he felt her wrist. One lean finger touched her cheek and then his hand went under her slightly twisted neck and his fingers explored her neck. When he stood up, the men crowded near and, he, and the spell was broken. Curdy came suddenly to life. I know who done it, he cried. That big son of a bitch done it. I know he done it. Why, everybody else was out there playing playing horseshoes. He worked himself into a fury. I'm going to get it. I'm going for my shock and I'll kill the big son of a bitch myself. I'll shoot him in the guts. Come on, you guys. He ran furiously out of the barn. Carlson said, I'll get my Luger. And he ran out too. Slim turned quietly to George. I guess then he done it all right, he said. Her, her next bust. Then he could have did it. Could have did that. George didn't answer, but he nodded slowly. His hat was so far down on his forehead that his eyes were covered. Slim went on, maybe like that time and weed you was telling about. Again, George nodded. Slim sighed. Well, I guess we got to get him. Where you think he might have went? It seemed to take George some time to free his words. He, he would have went south, he said. We come from north, so he probably would have went south. I guess we got to get him, Slim repeated. George stepped close. Couldn't we maybe bring him in and lock him up? He's nuts, Slim. He never done this to be mean. Slim nodded. We might, he said, if we could get keep Curly in we might but Curly's gonna want to shoot him Curly's still mad about his hand and suppose they lock him up and strap him down and put him in a cage that, that ain't no good George I know said George I know Carlson came running in the bastard stole my Luger he shot it ain't in my bag Curly followed him and Curly carried a shotgun in his good hand Curly was cold now all right you guys he said the n-word's got a shotgun you take it Carlson when you see him don't give him no chance shoot him for his guts that'll double I'm over that'll double him over Wiz said excitedly, I ain't got no gun. Curdy said, you go and solve the dad and get a cop. And Al Wiltz, he's deputy sheriff. Let's go now. He turned suspiciously on George. You're coming with us, fella. Yes, yeah, said George, I'll come. But listen, Curdy, the poor bastard's nuts. Don't shoot him. He didn't He didn't know what he was doing. Don't shoot him, Curdy cried. He got Carlson's Luger. Of course we'll shoot him. George said weakly, maybe Carlson lost his gun. I seen it this morning, said Carlson. No, it's been took. Slim stood. Looking down at Curdy's wife, he said, Curdy, maybe you better stay here with your wife. Curdy's face red, and I'm going. He said, I'm going to shoot the guts out of that big bastard myself. Even I, even if I got only one hand, I'm going to get him. Slim turned to Candy. You stay here with her then, Candy. The rest of us better get going. They moved away. George stopped a moment beside Candy, and they both looked down at the dead girl until Curdy yelled, You, George, you stick with us, so we don't think you had nothing to do with this. George moved slowly after them, and his feet dragged heavily. And when they were gone, Candy squatted down in the hay and watched the face of Curly's wife. Poor bastard, he said softly. The sound of the men grew fainter. The barn was darkening gradually, and in their stalls, the horses shifted their feet and rattled the halter chains. Old Candy laid down in the hay and covered his eyes with his arm. That's the end of that chapter.